always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the light side of life. Here we're looking at another managing stress technique, and this time we're looking at biofeedback. Now this is an example of a behaviourist approach. Um, now we've looked at behaviourism before, we looked at it as part of the AS course. Um, so have a think, how does reward and punishment affect the likelihood of a behaviour being repeated? Now we obviously looked at two different types of conditioning. We looked at classical conditioning and we looked at operant conditioning as part of the AS course. Um, and we've also mentioned it as part of the A2 as well. I'm sure you will remember the uh, Big Bang Theory clip with uh, Sheldon trying to condition Penny. And that was an example of operant conditioning. Okay, so operant conditioning is the conditioning that uses rewards and punishment. Classical conditioning is Pavlov's dogs. That's the example of uh, pairing a neutral stimulus with um, something that's going to elicit a response automatically. Okay, so when you've got uh, conditioning going on, the consequences of behaviour can lead to it either being repeated or not. Okay, and that's to do with reinforcement. So if the behaviour itself is rewarded, then it's more likely that you're going to repeat that behaviour. Okay, if that behaviour is punished, so for example, we give you a detention if you don't do your homework, the idea is that you don't repeat that behaviour again. Um, some examples of this happening in, in real life might be gambling. Okay, so you've uh, looked at fruit machine gambling when you did the um, Griffith study in AS, and that's an example of operant conditioning taking place, or at least Skinner would argue that's an example of operant conditioning taking place, where there's a variable reward schedule um, according to sometimes the machine pains out, sometimes it doesn't, and it's that potential promise of the reward that keeps people going back and going back and going back, and that's why people can become addicted to it. Okay, so that's the kind of principles, the ideas of operant conditioning as put forward by B.S. Skinner. And biofeedback is based around those principles. Okay, so how exactly are they used in biofeedback? Well, this time, as you might guess from the name, it's about giving feedback on one's biological functioning. Okay, um, so that might be visible feedback, it might be verbal feedback on the state of your own body in some way. So it could be on things like your heart rate, could be on things like your muscle tension, could be on things like your bladder fullness um, or your pelvic floor muscle. Okay, it's been used quite often for treating urinary incontinence, particularly in women. It's been quite successful for that. Okay, and the idea is that you give the visible or the verbal feedback on the state of your body and you reward the person. Um, for reducing the stress reaction, okay, and you reward them by reducing the anxiety, reducing the tension, um, reducing the headache. Um, and so if we get that reward, then we're more likely to repeat the method of reducing stress. And I'll talk a bit more detail about how it was used in this uh, study we're going to look at for reducing headaches. Okay, so this is a study um, by Bazinski. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's how you say it correctly or not. Um, this was done in 1970. Okay, so it's quite a long time ago now, um, and it was specifically looking at biofeedback in the reduction of tension headaches. Okay, so one specific um, stress-related uh, issue. Okay, so what was the aim of the study? Um, it was looking at whether previous research on biofeedback. Um, was due to a placebo effect or whether biofeedback was actually an effective method of reducing tension headaches. Because obviously if it's just a placebo uh, effect because they think they're having some treatment going on, it's actually a waste of money. Um, so they wanted to find out, okay, is it actually down to the biofeedback or is it just a placebo effect because somebody's taking an interest and because they're doing something about the headaches. So what was the methodology? Um, it was a laboratory experiment, okay, so highly controlled conditions. Um, what they did is they collected data by measuring muscle tension. Okay, They used an EMG, electromyography uh, feedback machine. And you can see in the picture there, um, somebody connected up to an EMG machine. Um, the number of pads they have on their heads or faces might, might vary depending on exactly what's going on. But uh, roughly it's going to look like that. And on the computer there, you can see an example of some of the feedback she's getting on her muscle tension. Um, the patients were also given psychometric tests of depression and they had to complete a questionnaire on their headaches and, and they had further follow-ups on that as well. Okay, so who were the participants in this study? Um, it's a pretty small sample size. Um, there were only 18 participants and they were all from Colorado. So instantly you can start to see some evaluative issues here. Um, one, it's a small sample. Two, it's rather ethnocentric. Um, it was a self-selected sampling. 
again, hopefully thinking back to the AS, you can think about some evaluative issues maybe from the fact that it's a self-selected sample. Um, they'd put an advert in a local newspaper um, asking for volunteers who suffered from headaches and migraines, and these people volunteered. Um, they didn't take any old person that volunteered, though. They did screen them quite carefully. So they had an initial screening by telephone, and they did have to undergo psychiatric and medical examinations before they were actually allowed to take part in the study. Um, and the sample was made up of two males and 16 females, um, age range 22 to 44 years. Now, you might think that that sample is not very representative because it has only two males and 16 females, but you may find that actually that's representative of the population who suffers from headaches. I don't know. Um, it could be that there are significantly more females suffering from headaches and migraines than there are males, in which case that would be representative. If that's not the case, then maybe it's down to who um, volunteers in these self-selected samplings. Okay, the design. Um, so it's an independent measures design. Hopefully you can all remember what that means. So each participant only takes, play, uh, takes part in one of the independent variables. And each participant was put into one of three groups. Okay, so only six participants in each group. Okay, so group A, these are one of the experimental groups. These were having the actual genuine biofeedback, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but the biofeedback sessions um, involved relaxation training and EMG feedback. Okay, group B had the relaxation training but only pseudo feedback, and group C, these were the control group. Okay, so they're just told they're on a waiting list, um, but they still had to come into the laboratory for appointments and checkups, which made sure that they stayed in the study, um, so it reduced attrition. Um, and also control for that that the others are getting attention and maybe just that attention is going to lower the number of headaches they're getting. Okay, so they had quite high levels of control there. Okay, so a bit more about the biofeedback itself. So they were connected up to the EMGs and they received feedback in the form of an audio feedback in the form of clicks. Okay, um, the closer together the clicks were, the more tension they were experiencing. The further apart the clicks were, the less tension they were experiencing in terms of the muscles. And they were trained that when those clicks were further together, they were to use the relaxation techniques they were taught to try and make those clicks further apart. Okay? Group B was connected up in the same way, had the relaxation training in the same way, but the clicks they were hearing were not their clicks at all. They bore absolutely no resemblance to how much muscle tension they had. Um, it was pseudo feedback, okay? It was from another, another patient's recording. So it didn't matter how much relaxation technique they did on themselves um, or how tense or how relaxed they were, the feedback didn't bear any resemblance, okay? Um, and they were, they were just told to focus on the clicks um, and just kind of pay attention to the clicks. Okay, um, so what else did they do? So for two weeks, um, the patients kept a record of their headaches and they had to rate them from mild to severe. Um, they also completed another questionnaire looking at depression, hysteria and hypochondria. Um, and over the course, groups A and B were given 16 sessions of training, okay, with two sessions each week, each week for eight weeks. Okay, so a relatively long study. Um, Kind of after the initial study had taken place, three months later, groups A and B were tested again, okay, using the EMG to test their muscle tension and were given a follow-up questionnaire. So, what did they find out? First of all, group A's muscle tension was significantly lower than group B's by the end of the training, okay, and this was even after three months, so after they'd finished all the training, had a three-month break, still their muscle tension is significantly lower. Also, group A's headaches significantly Reduced, okay neither of the other two groups had any change in terms of their headaches um, group A had a reduction in symptoms of other conditions as well including a drop in depression a drop in insomnia um, lower heart rate um, lower apathy and also reduced their fear of crowds okay so it, it didn't just seem to affect the headaches it also had a positive impact on various other things which might be related to anxiety related to tension related to stress specifically okay um both groups did report better social relationships so that was something that improved in both group a and group b um Drug usage, so that might be taking, it doesn't necessarily mean illegal or recreational drugs, it might be taking paracetamol, ibuprofen, things that would normally treat the headaches, um, decreased more in group A than in group B as well. So they're requiring, requiring less medication than group B. 
be. Um, and when they contacted them later, they weren't able to get hold of all of the original participants in Group A and B, but the ones that they did get hold of, even a significant amount of time later, um, still reported uh, an improvement in terms of their headaches. So it seemed to be a relatively long-lasting effect. Um, so the overall conclusion was that biofeedback is an effective way of training patients to relax and reducing their tension headaches. Okay, so that's the study. What you need to think about and be prepared to talk about next lesson is thinking about the evaluation, okay? Think about the sample. Okay, there are some, clearly some issues there. What about the methodology? There are some issues, but there are definitely some strengths there as well. Okay, ethics. Actually, the fact that Group C were late and given treatment um, potentially means there was no harm there, but what about Group B? Um, they never actually got any real treatment. Um, Generalisation. Not only amongst the whole population in terms of the representativeness of the sample, but also thinking about, okay, what about the other symptoms of stress? Headaches are just one symptom of stress. Is it going to work for anything else, or is it specific to stress? Um, issues of validity. Um, clearly, demand characteristics might be an issue here. If they figured out that they want them to reduce the number of headaches, are they going to lie on their self-reports about the number of headaches they're experiencing just to please the experimenter? Um, Although it was followed up afterwards, there are questions obviously over the long-term effectiveness. You know, if you went back a year later, two years later, excuse me, is it still going to be effective? And there's obviously the issue of ecological validity. Could you use these findings in real life? Always look on the bright side of life. Always look on the light.